So we'll start with uh, a prayer to the Larrys and Panates of technology and hope that the virtual will be virtuous today. Our talk is on seeing and not seeing the symbol, Greta Thunberg, the demon devotee, and Jung's virgin Sophia. So three items. Uh, mostly will be with slides, <clears throat> which I'll start in a moment. Sonu Shamdasani writes in the introduction to the Black Books, symbols, Jung argued, stemmed from the unconscious, and their creation was the most important function of the unconscious. While compensation was always present, the symbol-creating function was only present, when we were willing to recognize it. The recognition and recovery of this symbol-creating power is portrayed in Liber Novus. The psyche's capacity to make and respond to symbolic images, what Jung calls the transcendent function that mediates between the ego and the unconscious, or culturally between these times and the depths, is challenged even more in our image-filled but depth-deprived era than it was over a hundred years ago when Jung wrote and painted the Red Book. Post-enlightenment mind has trouble taking depth seriously and tends to deny its reality or to distort the images in which it appears. The Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh writes, quote, Ours was a time when most forms of art and literature were drawn into the modes of concealment that prevented people from recognizing the realities of their plight. End quote. Refusal or inability to respond to the depth or symbolic dimension leads to a loss of reality, yet access to deep reality, or to call it by its old name, the sacred, is always hard. In spite of its intrinsic difficulty and our resistance, symbolic images at times open our minds to another that has been waiting for us. This paper will circle around one such image, the person and symbol of the teenage Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, in whom we believe in whom we believe some has some to some degree broken through. The depths have to some degree broken through in her. It also explores the psychology of those who refuse her message, aiming to show that the symbol deniers are also part of the mythical story they try to cancel. Here's a counselor. We will view Greta and her detractors alongside two related clusters of symbolic imagery. The demon devotee theme in ancient and contemporary Indian art, <clears throat> and Carl Jung's images of seeing and not seeing the archetypal revelation in the Red Book. We focus on plate 155, a complex image that evolved from Jung's drawing during his North African trip of a Berber woman. To become an amalgam of Sophia, the Virgin, and the daughter of God. 
After reviewing our previous work on the theme of seeing in Indian religious art, we will focus on how humans try not to see the divine symbol, yet must inevitably open or be opened to its force. We pay special attention to the Indian demon devotee, a figure frequently encountered in the iconology of Shiva, Vishnu, and the goddess. The basic structure of this mythology is that a demon becomes strong enough to challenge the greatest god, but is violently overcome by her, and in the end, orients towards his conqueror in blissful surrender. Refusal or inability to see the divine <clears throat> is also a repeated theme in the Red Book. Ambivalence, ignorance, or outright alienation are particularly clear in plates 125, 155, and 169. Similarly, Greta Thunberg's symbolic activism has met refusal or inability to respond to her mythical presence. Why we do not and salvation of the dead in Jung's seven sermons and the existential crises of our time. We'll follow these three threads. or to resemble the demon devotee and Greta Thunberg as a powerful break symbol to open the question of being versus and which is also at the center of the Bengali writer Ami. of Gosha's recent novel, Quest for Soul and God Images, and Jung's struggle with the refusal or inability to see them when they appear in the three paintings and the seven sermons. Third, we turn to the The climate change deniers, who nevertheless recognize her force, have insistent even at Time Magazine's Person of the Year for 2019. Our goal is to uncover the psychological and symbolic meaning of this young Al. Um, Al, can you hear me? Again, it's an Indian image. Al, can you hear me? Al, can you hear me? Murray? <laughs> yes. Um, we're having problems hearing you. Can you turn off the video and just read the lecture so we get the sound but not the images? Because uh, You're not getting the images. We're not, we're not getting the sound. Uh, the sound is very broken up. So if you if you can, um, oh boy, cancel the images and just uh, read the text, maybe. Hmm? Turn off your camera. Yes, our technician here suggests you turn off your camera. Um, does that? He doesn't turn off his images, just his camera. Yeah, just your camera. Is good. We don't see you but we can see the images. Yeah. yeah. If you turn off your camera there. Turn off. Can you do that, Al? Now it's locked. Uh -huh.
They're going to try again. Yeah. Is he going to come back? Yeah, <laughs> we hope to get him back. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we have a suggestion that we all pray to the technological gods. Seriously. <laughs> Murray, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Now, if okay. you can turn off your camera, we can see the images and we'll be able to hear you, but we won't oh. see the two of you. Okay. But, okay, but we can get the images, which are very important in your talk, and we can get your voice. Okay. Okay. Um, except the images have now disappeared. Um, I'm going to have to go back here to PowerPoint. And then this one. There you see a nice picture of Al and his daughter and his wife. Let's see, can you see the images and hear me now? We can hear you, but we don't see images. No images. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Shut the, shut the PowerPoint. You need to shut the PowerPoint, they tell me. Huh. Or share shut the, the screen. Yeah, can you share the screen now? Um, well, share I am now. You're sharing the screen? Yes. Yeah. And you have PowerPoint? Yes, PowerPoint is on the screen, at least on my computer, hmm. our computer. It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. But I don't want a video. That's not a video. I, should I just shut off the PowerPoint and restart it? I really have no idea of this. We have to have the shared screen, but. Uh... Okay, I'm going to shut off. Launch meeting. I have his text and his uh, on my cell phone. Right, 
if you have a file you can share it, you could download it onto this computer. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's here's the here's his these are his pictures. I'll speak like you tell me. I'm straight. What should I say? Okay. Oh, we see you, Al. Great. Okay, shall I try share screen again? Try share screen. Okay, you can if he try if he tries share the screen. Yeah. Try to share the screen. Okay. 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 Okay, we've got the screen now. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. <clears throat> if you turn off your camera, we we don't need to see you. We need to hear you and see the the slides. Okay. How can I do that? Um, okay, perfect. Uh, see anything that says turn off camera? You got it, Al. So you. I can, did it. Yeah, you did. Great. It. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. So. I think we're probably okay. Slideshow insert slideshow. Let us begin with an Indian image. Um, from beginning, and then we're somewhere around here. There. <clears throat> okay, so I think this is more or less where we are. So let us begin with an Indian three, image. Three themes. We kind of lost you on the three themes. If you can go back to that. Okay. okay, we'll follow these three trails. Jung's paintings of inability or refusal to respond to the symbol. The demon devotee and Greta Thunberg as a partly successful breakthrough symbol. To open the question of seeing versus not seeing, we'll begin with the Indian theme of Darshan, which is Sanskrit for seeing. As imagined in a few examples of Indian sacred art, and especially in the demon devotee image, which is also at the center of the Bengali writer Amitav Ghosh's recent novel, Gun Island. Second, we look at the Red Book quest for soul and God symbols and Jung's struggle with the refusal or inability to see them when they appear <coughs> in the three paintings and in the seven sermons. And third, we turn to the remarkable Greta Thunberg, an actual person, but also an image of symbolic power that climate change deniers who nevertheless recognize her force have insistently demeaned and ridiculed even after she was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year for 2019. Our goal is to uncover the psychological and symbolic meaning of this young person and amplify it with Red Book materials and the vision found in Indian art and literature. Let me see if I can get the correct. Uh, okay, so let's begin then with an Indian image. This is one of the three faces of Shiva carved in the cave temple of Elephanta on an island near Bombay. Shiva meditates with eyes closed, clearly in another realm, yet still here in our world, carved in the stone of the cave and available to be seen by the worshiper or the casual tourist. It is evident on entering the aura of the image that its vision was there before we came into the divine presence and that we enter a field of seeing that existed before the image was chipped from the stone. This theme of seeing before we see, being seen before we see, and the priority of the gaze of the divine to our human gaze is reiterated many times in Jung's work, beginning with what he called his original dispensation dream at age three of a phallus on a golden throne. A mag quote, a magnificent throne, something was standing on it. It was a huge thing, 
made of skin and naked flesh, and on top was something like a rounded head with no face and no hair. On the very top of the head was a single eye gazing motionlessly upward. We suggest that this phallic being sees virtually the approach of the dreaming child in the same way that Shiva's inward vision does not focus on the pilgrim in front of the image. Let's see, what am I looking for here? It creates. Um, Yeah. Right. Does not focus on the pilgrim, yet creates the light that makes it possible for the visitor to see the divinity beyond the image in the stone. Jung puzzled throughout his life over the ritual phallus of the dream, and in several places recognizes the truth that the unconscious sees him as much as or more than he sees it. The paradigmatic example perhaps being the 1944 post-heart attack dream of a yogi whom Jung realized was dreaming him. We'll use the Indian theme of darshan as a paradigm to clarify Jung's Red Book paintings and the symbolic life of Greta Thunberg. The Elephanta image of Shiva meditating implies a viewer, a worshiper to contemplate the three-headed image of the God. Like that implicit devotee, we are drawn into the image and begin to see with the God's eye. The images of the divine in Indian sacred art are similar to avatars, descents of the divine into our world. Like Krishna and Rama, they appear in our world to give us the vision of what is beyond our world. The image is alive, it precedes our vision of it, and makes the latter possible, opening us to receive its meaning. As the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna gives Arjuna a divine eye, able to see his Krishna's supernal nature. All sacred images give us the potential to see, in some measure, the transcendent being that lies behind them and approaches us through them. The Shiva image implies this being that lies behind the three images we see here, the three heads, a fourth subtle presence that remains hidden in the stone, and yet, as it were, emits the other three. One of the most beloved images of darshan and Hindu art is the mutual vision of Krishna and Radha. The favorite among the cowgirls or gopis with whom the young god sports in the springtime gardens of Vrindavan. Radha sees Krishna already seeing her, a gaze that gives her a divine eye able to see him, and also herself through her reflection in his eye. The image of unconflicted darshan is not (coughs) limited to lovers. It is also characteristic of the guru-disciple relationship. I first met my guru in a dream when he gave me Shaktipa, Descent of Grace, This initiation awakens the kundalini energy and begins the transformation of the personality. When I went to India later that year, I met him face to face in Darshan. Two of us were waiting in his personal room that day. An elderly, white-haired Indian disciple was called first. He bowed, placed flowers at Baba's feet. Baba then wrapped him in a shawl and brought him close, and began speaking to him with love. You have been with me a long time. No, you are the self. I witness waves of energy coming from Baba's body as golden light, each wave lifting me to a higher state of consciousness. Then it was my turn, and I could hardly get to my feet to approach Baba. Tears of joy were running down my face. 
Before I knew it, I was in his lap, and he was feeding me chocolates and pounding my back with his fist. He quoted Tukaram, a 16th century saint in our lineage. To receive Shaktipa in a dream is very rare. You have received Shaktipa in this way. And then a moment between us came when I looked straight into his eyes. I was surprised I had no fear. I saw an ocean in his eyes, and in the next instant saw the ocean within my own eyes. Then our separate oceans crashed together, becoming one. Baba said, it is complete. Yet darshan is not always smooth. God or the guru can decline to communicate, or more commonly, the human who needs to encounter God can refuse to see her, or even try to appropriate the God's power as his own. The Indian theme most that most addresses the question of refusal or inability to see is the demon devotee, an ego-possessed opponent of the god who attempts to usurp the god's power and take possession of her realm. Inevitably, the demon is defeated by the god, typically through a trick that penetrates the demon's seemingly invincible defenses. For instance, a demon who cannot be killed by air or water and neither by day nor by night is attacked at twilight with a weapon made of foam. But the demon's defeat is also frequently his salvation, as it proves a way to transcend his claim that the whole world is about him. An image which is very widely repeated in Indian art is this of Shiva dancing on the demon named Apasmara, which means forgetfulness. Shiva dances and crushes him. But a look at Apasmara's face shows things differently, deeper reading of his state. As is frequently the case, the demon's expression is one of bliss. Enraptured by the music, dance, and the spell of the flickering fire. All images here. He falls into a samadhi of adoration of his former enemy. A second dream of Elaine's shows a similar transformation from a fight-or-flight response to one of surrender and bliss. Years later, I dreamed I was in India with Baba's successor, Guru Mai. Ever since my spiritual practice began under Baba's direction, nightmares of cobras had increased. I was standing on a platform. From the corner of my eye, I saw Guru Mai walking with a few disciples. She saw me from a distance and stopped to call forth cobras from the earth. As each snake came into her hand, she flung it at me. I was terrified. The first cobra fell a little short. The next was closer. I was sweating. I repeated the mantra, trying to hold my ground and not run. The cobras came closer to me until one landed directly on me. It wrapped itself around my neck and rose straight up with a hood fully open. Coming around my face, it bit me five times on my lips. I was in agony. Then my crown chakra opened, and the cobra dove into it and down through my entire body to my feet. The dream shifts. I was departing the Bombay airport, and I saw my experience being played back to me on a TV monitor. But it was different. When I had thought I was being bitten by the cobra on my lips, I was actually kissing it. When I thought I was in agony, I saw that I had been in bliss. I realized that what I had experienced as terror from the ego's perspective was just the opposite from the viewpoint of surrender to the self. Amitav Ghosh's novel, Gun Island, 
repeats the demon devotee theme, imagining the demon as a modern prophet-seeking merchant. Manasa, here the goddess of snakes, sees the trader, seeks the trader as her devotee. Later he is revealed to be an agent of Venetian colonialism. But instead of honoring the goddess and her land, the Ganges plain uh, delta, uh, as she demands, he seeks to turn it into profit for himself. Manasa is relentless in her pursuit of the trader, but the merchant continues to resist. He wants to live for himself and not for the goddess. It becomes a life or death struggle. The merchant has himself locked in an iron storage box to protect against the goddess's advances. Just as he thinks himself safe, she finds a way in through an unnoticed crack in the iron. A venomous spider enters and bites him almost fatally. His effort not to see what he has done and also not to be seen is thwarted. To switch to our contemporary world, rich imperialists and capitalists, among the primary causes of climate change, try not to see or to be affected, to be seen or affected by the world that they have made. Their iron box will be the last islands or mountaintops imagined to be invulnerable to the heating of the air and rise of sea levels. We predict that the goddess will find them out even there. We see Jung's Virgin Sophia anima image as isomorphic with Manasa and also with Greta. All three seek but do not always find devotees. Manasa and Greta seek to compel recognition of the effects of our self-centeredness, the heating of the planet and disruption of its systems, and to convert us to a new vision of our world based on ecological values. Jung's anima image shows a symbolic transformation of the Christian church and our Christian culture through an emergence of the goddess who is mostly ignored or rejected by the congregation and society to whom she is revealed. A feminine presence who expresses the Hebrew Bible, Sophia, wisdom, and also the New Testament, Virgin Mary, erupts in the place of the altar. The locus where divine and human connect, opening the walls of the church and revealing the crescent moon and a shower of gold that halos the goddess's head. Below her are a number of figures, including at least one ecclesiastic, who seem to have little or no appreciation of her significance, although the light on some of their faces emanates from her. This is from Jill Mellock. Although seeing by her light, they seem to have little awareness of her meaning. The image of the Virgin Sophia is deeply complex, but it uses an ordinary woman as its carrier, something like day residue in a dream. We suggest the same in the case of Greta. An ordinary person bears the weight of the archetype, like Joan of Arc or the peasant boy through whom the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared. We view Greta's story and media presence mythically and seek parallels for the suggestive events and circumstances of her life. Greta is singled out for special status like many shamans and religious figures by the creative illness through, wh through which she must pass on her way to her individual gnosis. Like shamans gifted with a different brain, and Greta is on the autism spectrum, she also endured elective mutism, self-starvation, and depression before arriving at her life work of showing the world an unflinching view of the reality of environmental devastation. Anorexia permanently restricted her growth 
and she looks much younger than her age, making her a better vessel for the child archetype. Among Greta's symbolic acts, crossing the great water, the Atlantic Ocean, via sailboat on her way to speak at the United Nations stands out. The UN appearance itself was equally symbolic, not least because of the chance half encounter with Donald Trump in the hall before, where the camera shows Greta fixing Trump with a recognitive look as the Donald, out of focus and blurred, seems to turn away to avoid her eye. In her strength and capacity to stand up to adults and prick their pretensions and imperfections, Greta resembles her fellow Swede, Pippi Longstocking, the eponymous heroine of popular children's books. Greta is an oppositional child whose symbolic qualities catch adult attention better than the dry scientific facts that she reports. Greta directs our attention to a reality that most of us cannot bear to see, the sun setting on human civilization and the profound injury it has done to our planet. What Greta recognizes is like Carl Jung's pre-war visions of a rising tide of blood and Europe inundated with the flotsam of human devastation. It was both personal and world historic, and the history itself is also symbolic. As Jung was told, Greta knows that it will come to pass, and it cannot be doubted. Jung's visions were part of the reason he began the imaginal journey which became the Red Book, and he kept them at the forefront of his mind. Greta looks one-pointedly and sees without blinking. Like Jung, after her dark night of visions, she is called to reveal what she sees. It is essential to the symbolic function that it refers at once to the outer world, the physical universe, human society and culture, and to the inner psychic world. It was the fact of that connection that allowed Jung to recognize himself at the advent of the Great War as a sane, real person, not the madman he feared he was becoming, and comically reimagined in the asylum section of the Red Book. The symbol is precognitive. It shows us the way of what is to come and orients us in respect to that. The inner transformation that the symbol makes possible is ineluctably tied to the events in the outer world in which we live. This connection may be the essence of synchronicity and the alchemical unus mundus. Let's look at the precognitive function of the symbol in Jung, Greta, and the Indian material. Jung and Greta each foresee an actual event in the world the Great War and planetary devastation. Similarly, it is one of the narrative tasks of Gosha's novel to find recent events that correspond to the psycho-spiritual struggle between the snake goddess Manasa and the merchant she pursues. Gosh finds it in the 17th century colonialism, specifically the beginning of the exploitation and destruction of the Gangetic Delta mangrove forest, called the Sundarbans, or the Beautiful Forest. Ghosh imagines the goddess of the Sundarbans loosing her power on the human world in a snake bite, a tornado, a synchronicity of animal migrations, to bring us to a recognition of our proper place in the spiritual and biological ecosystem of planet Earth. Ghosh would recognize the virus as a multiform of Manasseh's insidious spider, slipping through the walls of our quarantine to pierce us with the spike proteins on its surface. The Sophia Virgin image contains multiple symbolic references. She is the Hebrew Bible's wisdom, Sophia, the New Testament virgin, mother of Christ. 
She appears in the place of the altar, and Jung says she is the new altar, the place of interchange between humans and God, thus the quintessential symbol. Her appearance removes the outer walls of the church, allowing the crescent moon to shine through into the sanctum. A shower of gold, so I can find her here. A shower of gold pours through the apparently absent roof to halo the goddess. These momentous events go unnoticed or are actively rejected by the crowd of people moving about below. Their faces lit by the effulgent figure above, but their inner eyes unable to open to her meaning. This theme of the goddess appearing through the now absent walls of a church were repeated in a third dream of Elaine's about six years ago. I was sent on a search and rescue mission as part of a group of fellow practitioners of yoga. We were in a devastated city that reminded me of Dresden after the World War II firebombing. Most buildings were flattened. Walking the streets amid the rubble, I saw on the left a cathedral that had been mostly blown apart by the bombing. However, part of the back wall was still standing. Through the wall, somehow I could see a statue, larger than life, of a goddess. I could make out that there had been a second wall constructed in front of the goddess, and that wall was now gone, so she could be seen from inside the cathedral by worshippers, from whom formerly she would have been hidden. The goddess was free. She had always been there, but had been walled off by the builders of the church. Now she could be seen. Two other paintings from the Red Book repeat this theme of not relating to the archetypal world. In image 125, a wartime city, mostly industrial, but with vestiges of earlier medieval life, goes about its business with no awareness of the blazing, fiery cross in the sky above or the divine child figure trying to mediate between it and the oblivious urban world below. The last picture in the Red Book, 169, is even more enigmatic. What Jay Sherry has called an atomic mandala in the lower left corner radiates light in fractionated colors into a field of unfinished caricatured heads. Those farther away from the explosive mandala include skulls and skeletons with a primitive appearance, often painted in a livid green. Kylie Laughlin has done extensive research on this image, finding in it Jung's continuing commitment to his life task of bringing light to the dead, who included his forebears, but primarily the dead aspects of our civilization and culture. Prominent among the latter is Christianity, which Jung worked to treat, Murray Stein's insight, and redeem in his alchemical writings, Answer to Job, etc. This treatment is exactly what we believe is happening in image 155, where the virgin wisdom anima manifests in place of, or as Jung says, as the altar thus transforming Christianity by restoring the feminine to its proper place. She, like Manasseh, seeks to have us as her devotees, but we, represented in the figures of the humans milling about below the divine image, will have little to do with it. Like the merchant in the Indian story, the figures turn away or simply cannot see the miracle appearing before them, that illuminates them from outside their awareness. In the article on image in their Dictionary of Jungian Analysis, Samuels et al. note that, quote, the symbolic image is endowed with a generative power. Its function is to arouse. It is psychically compelling, end quote. But the power of the image cannot be effective unless the person to whom it appears opens to it 
relates to it, engages in a dialogue of feeling with it. Jung says, quote, if this crucial operation of entering in with your own reaction is not carried out, all the changes are left to the flow of images, and you yourself remain unchanged, end quote. Isolation from the symbol is what we find in the three red book plates. There is little relationship to the divine image, and so the persons to whom the image directs itself are not transformed and they become the dead, whom Jung, often as angrily as Greta or Manasa Devi, attempts to treat, i.e. show the reality of their relationship to the divine. These images reveal both the power of the connection with the numinous depth that Jung recognized and tried to show others, and his sadness, even despair, over the resistance to seeing it, that he encountered in our dead civilization. In the seven sermons, Jung took on the role of cultural teacher or prophet, which was to be his personal myth for the rest of his life. He gradually realized that this role was itself a symbol to which he must be open and relate. He must perform it, but not claim it as his own property. He called it Philemon, among other names, and especially in the interstitial dialogues between Jung and Philemon in the Red Book version of the sermons, he worked on his relationship to this guru figure. It is significant that he placed his painting of Philemon, 154, next to his other teacher, the anima, represented by the Sophia Virgin image on the facing page. Like Elijah and Salome pre previously, the numinous, um, the numinous symbolic quality of Greta Thunberg's image is like this, as even her detractors have realized. The anger in the symbolic Greta and the rage against her, the person and the symbol, can be viewed as epitomizing the two sides of a conflict that is emerging as a defining struggle of our age. To understand our time, we must recognize the symbolic character of the climate crisis and coronavirus, their announcement of the world's response to our misuse of it, and also realize that humans' resistance to climate change is also part of the myth. The demon devotee, the populist response to Greta and Jung's images show what is going on in the refusal to see the symbol that demands our attention. In each of Jung's images, humans are pictured beside a numinous figure, an image of the anima as portal to or part of the, the god image or self, an explosively radiant mandala, and a flaming cross. It is not exactly that the human figures don't see the self-image to which they are placed in juxtaposition, but rather that for the most part they show no personal engagement with it. They go about their business or actively resist. In amplifying the psychology underlying climate deniers, we might think of the Gnostic Demiurge. The denier, who is usually an extreme individualist, is a man, gendered like the Demiurge, of surpassing ignorance and little ultimate strength. He puffs himself up, despite and because of weakness, as all-powerful. Like Donald Trump, he can do whatever he wants. Demiurge psychology on this reading creates a secondary world, that of neoliberal human self-centered enterprise, which has no place for the actual environing world in which he lives except as usable material for his enjoyment. His power exists only within this egocentric space. Like Heinz Kohut's narcissistic personality, he is split between a half that flouts and tries to impose his power and another half 
It feels what the conscious tries to suppress. The terror lying in the darkness outside his streetlight arc of superficial knowledge and control. Messages from that black surround are repelled by the narcissistic pretender caught in the light of denial. Like Gosha's spider, they would poison all the assumptions inside. The fantasy of growth, power over the earth, and eventually the galaxy, the conquest of death, and a life of endless desires fulfilled by a world wholly under his control. This image is essentially the derangement Amitav Ghosh writes of. It is the merchant and the capitalist nation-state under whose aegis he sails, spreading civilization, CO2, and now the coronavirus over the planet. It is evident that in the end, demons must be forced to see the message of the symbol and experience the disillusion of their imagined autonomy and conquest. They need to become devotees. Jung's encounter with the dead shows a similar kind of evolution, although the dead are simply incomplete and not demonic. A crowd of dead Anabaptists sought his help in answering questions about their faith. A pilgrimage to Jerusalem left them unsatisfied, and they returned to Jung's house two years later, still seeking answers. In the Red Book version of the sermons to these dead, the response comes from his demon Philemon. The dead are made able to die in peace, and rise up, quote, like smoke above the shepherd's fire, end quote, into their individual stars. Like the demon devotee, they leave behind their frenzy and rage. The situation in the three red book paintings is not as complete. In 125, the blazing cross evokes no response in the war preparations going on below. In the last painting, 169, the dead are unfinished and at best partially open to the blazing mandala in the bottom left corner. In the anima image, 155, the Nazis seem to have many ways of turning away from or against the goddess who is destined to become their new altar. Nevertheless, as in Elaine's dream, there is no real doubt about what has happened in this image. The walls of the church are gone. The crescent moon shines in, signaling the arrival of the goddess, whose halo of gold flakes seems, like Zeus in the story of Danae, to descend from the opening in the roof. So how can they not see? How can the boring fantasy of ego control deny the blazing revelation of the divine in her world-destroying and transforming theophany? The force of this question is at the heart of Greta Thunberg's symbolic power. She looks us, especially those with power and money, in the eye and puts the question starkly. How could you not know? She is not announcing facts. She is demanding that we recognize the truth of our denial and stop it. The symbol is not just an indication or a sign of something that remains hidden, but is an actual early manifestation of what it symbolizes. Jung's visions did not just show the approach of World War I. They were part of what we might call, with Star Wars, a disturbance in the Force that was a prodromal manifestation of what developed into the Great War. The same for Greta. Her vision of a heating, flooding disaster is her body and mind's sense of being directly moved and affected by the calamity. To see the symbol is not knowing of something. It is a partial identity with the divine or archetypal content, a knowing by being. 
Conversely, those who cannot feel it in themselves or themselves in it don't just not see. They manifest resistance that is part of the symbolic process itself. What is needed today is precisely the recognition that our cultural not knowing is symbolic. Like the demon devotee or Jung's dead, and it is an essential part of the story of these times. Thank you.